Welcome back to another episode of Off Hours with Bourbon Lens. And today we're excited to talk to one of the traveling people in Bourbon as we head to, to Bardstown to talk to Sam Montgomery, who is the national brand ambassador for Bardstown Bourbon Company. So Sam, thanks for joining the Bourbon Lens. Happy to. Thanks for having me, Jake. Of course. Uh, Sam and I got to know each other quite a bit last year during the world top whiskey taster, which uh, I got to go compete in in Atlanta and then onward into Bardstown as a, as a finalist. And uh, Sam uh, also became good friends with my dad along the way because Gerald uh, never met a stranger. So what's that like getting to meet the Llewellyn family uh, as a whole uh, throughout that experience? Uh, that was maybe the highlight of my year uh, <laughs> was hanging out with you and your dad and getting to know the Llewellyn family. That was, that was something I'll never forget for sure. Uh, yeah. He's a, he's a memorable character. He, right before uh, I started this podcast, he just showed up at my house. He was like, what's going on? And I'm like, I got things to do, man. You can't just show up. <laughs> um, but love him to death. Um, that's what happens when you, you live like a mile away from your parents. They just show up. True. So, you know, I'm going to ask you one work question because I think it's important. Like, how does someone become a national brand ambassador for one, if not the hottest brands in whiskey and spirits in, in general? Because Bardstown Bourbon Company is that. Uh, yeah. So I I love this question because I, you know, I was kind of as surprised to have landed the role as, as many people may wonder, like, man, how, how do you get that role? I kind of I kind of ask myself that a lot sometimes and, and I, I credit it to you know, being in the right place at the right time certainly has a lot to do with it. Um, and you know, I, I've talked about this many times before as kind of bartending is what took me to, um, you know, segueing into the spirits industry is more of a career. And I, I will say that as cliche as it might sound for anyone in the service industry out there, you've definitely heard this treat, every single customer, like they could be the future CEO of a new startup bourbon company, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, if that's, if that's your goal, right? Because especially bartending in Louisville or anywhere else where it's like a, like a hub of activity of entrepreneurs in the spirits industry and executives in the spirits industry, you never know who you're waiting on. And if you just make the right impression, you, you, you provide that hospitality and knowledge that they're looking for from a bartender, it could you know, it could grow or evolve into a, a, an ex opportunity. So that's, that's kind of how it ap happened for me in a nutshell, which is, you know, is it, lucky. It's fortunate, right? Yeah. Well, I think you can take a, a lesson away from that, right? You never know who you're going to talk to. And so if you're, you're to your highest standards, right. And you're, you know, servicing the people the way you need to service them in the industry, it could lead a, into a job. Yeah, precisely. So, a lot of people may not know about this about you, but you're from central Illinois. So how does one go from central Illinois, Peoria, the home of Caterpillar, right? To, you know, finding their, their, their way down to bourbon, uh, country in, in Bardstown and in Louisville. Um, you know, that's a great question. I think that a lot of it was kind of dumb luck and, and being in my early twenties had not a whole lot else going on. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, no, no significant other, no kids and, and, you know, the right suggestion essentially. But, you know, I, bartending in central Illinois, you definitely kind of, you kind of cap out where you can get career wise mm -hmm. as far as bartending or the service industry. Right. And I think in my early twenties, it was so great. It was like, man, this is steady money. Bartending is great money. I've got my own place. I've got my own you know, car things, friends. And then, and then after a couple of years of being just very stagnant, it was like, Oh, I need, I need a new challenge. And mm -hmm. I, for a lot of people where I'm from, everyone just moves to Chicago because that's the nearest place to go get that ex type of experience, right? Whatever you're looking for. But, um, I had visited Kentucky a couple of times with my best friend who had family in Kentucky and we had stayed in Louisville. And I just thought it was this very well kept secret for like a fun city to visit, right? Like you, you have awesome bars and restaurants, you've got museums, you've got sports teams, you, there's so many things to do, but it's got this kind of small town feel to it, right? Like Southern hospitality and everything's a little bit slower. Traffic isn't terrible. So it had always been kind of like 
in the back of my mind, like, wow, this, this could be a cool city to live in. And then, you know, when I realized that I was kind of like, just not as, as intellectually stimulated or challenged professionally with, you know, bartending where I was, I thought, man, I love bourbon. That was always kind of came naturally to me as I started drinking and, and bartending. Um, I just kind of thought, wow, like Louisville, if you were ever just going to rub elbows with the right people, which mm-hmm. is the only way I've gotten anywhere, in life, <laughs> uh, Louisville might be the place, right? Like if you, if you work at a nice bar where, where people are coming out to eat, coming out to drink, having business meetings, having business client dinners and stuff like that, like maybe that's how I get in and get out yeah. <laughs> for attending a little bit. And it's, it's really weird. I think. I'm kind of a walking cliche when you talk to me for too long, but I really do think that when you, when you make one right move yep. like the, or the first right move or the first big step, like the universe, if it's the right thing to do, the universe is going to give you a giant push. Right. Mm-hmm. So it took a lot of risk and faith to get up and move to Kentucky. But then a year of, of living there, I had started my first day at Bardstown bourbon company. So it, it just kind of seemed like it was meant to happen. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's awesome. And I have never been ballsy enough to take that big step. Uh, I just did switch companies and I guess that's the best, the biggest, boldest move I've made, but like I played it safe for so long. So like, I love when people take these bold steps. I've talked to you. I've talked to David Mandel. I've talked to Brandon about like moving across the country to come to Bardstown even like, right. There's these big grandiose steps that could lead to, you know, some awesome experiences. And, you know, one of the things I think that's interesting, so your makeup is from, from the outside looking in, I I know you enough, right? Is you're, you're on, you have to be on, you're representing a brand. Hospitality is the game. How does one that may be extroverted or have some introverted tendencies, how do you break that up? How do you find some balance in that? Because you got to have time to retreat to, to recharge Sam so that the, the rest of the country can get the best version of her. It's still a, a very uh, big balancing act. It's 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 something that I I work on every single day because I, I I fail at it a lot. If I'm being honest, like I I love what I do, so it's it's very easy for me to be over consumed in it and kind of forget about you know the things that make me me, which isn't always going to be just bourbon or just my job. Right. So Mm -hmm. I think one of the the biggest blessings that happened was, you know, or silver lining, I wouldn't call it overall a blessing, (laughs) but was the pandemic, right? I started talking to my sisters and my mom every single day over FaceTime. And when the world kind of picked up again, um, you know, and our schedules got, got busy again, I was still doing it way more than I had before the pandemic because mm-hmm. we had gotten so accustomed to it and we liked staying in touch. So that, that's one thing I think, you know, talking to your family or, you know, good friends, like it's so easy to lose, you know, sense of time, you know, like months can go by and I don't talk to my best friend and I hate that. Yeah. But we try to hold each other accountable for that and say like, Hey, it's time. We, we need to schedule a FaceTime Sunday, you know, let's watch, the bachelorette Monday night and then gossip about it, you know, afterwards, like really making like, it it sounds weird because, you know, I'm going to be 31 next month. I was never like, let's make plans. Let's, let's put this in the calendar to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like life has certainly happened. Right. And, and it seems silly that we need to like schedule calls with our loved ones and our friends. But like, that's been something I've been implementing a lot just to stay, grounded because mm-hmm. nothing can ground better than your friends and your family. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's so true. Like we get, we allow ourselves to be consumed by our work, right. And our work becomes our identity, but we're so much more than that as individuals. Right. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in I'm X and that's my job title. I'm the national brand ambassador. I'm head of sales or I'm head of whatever. And you're like, that defines you. And then you're just on all the time. And then everything else that is really who you may are made up to be is kind of shrunk away. And I'm guilty of that just as much as anyone. Like I traveled a ton before the pandemic and the silver lining to me was I got to see my son grow up and 
take his first step, say his first words. Like I'm not lost on, on all of those things either, because I think that's what makes life precious is getting to experience the moments uh, and those moments in between where you're not focused on work and how you, how you make money, even if you have fun doing it. Yeah, totally. So as, as we transition out of, you know, how do you do the balancing act? Like you, you move to, to Louisville and, and you take on this job and you start to travel and, and, you know, build this brand up. How do you es- escape to have fun? Like what is your idea of fun outside of, you know, hosting these uh, tastings or um, building up the brand and, and bringing your products to market? What are, what are some of the fun things that Sam likes to do when she's not working? Yeah. So it depends if I'm not working and I'm home is very different than if I'm not working and I'm out in the market, right. With just some extra days. So when I'm out in the market, we'll start there because it's more fun. I uh, am a huge comedy fan. I love stand up comedy, especially sketch comedy, improv, all that stuff. So I immediately try to look up if there's a comedy club or something, uh, you know, like that to, to go visit. Because, and that is one of those places, usually if you're in like a, if you're in a big city like, or like a, a very touristy comedy club, um, like I've probably been to the comedy cellar in New York, like at least six times, mm. they make you put your phone in a Ziploc bag, turn it off completely, not just silence it, put it in a bag and you can't get it till the end of the show. So you're, you're kind of forced to be like in this room full of strangers for this one purpose to be like entertained <laughs> and find like common interest. Yeah. Like I, that's a whole comedian's job, right. Is to get a group full of strangers to laugh at the same thing. I think that's an incredible, like elevating human experience. Mm. Um, so I try to do that as much as I can when I'm out in the market, it's kind of go experience the pulse of the city without being super branded, you know? So it's either a comedy club or a dive bar. Like I love my divey, divey, divey bars because you just, you really get to know a city for, for its dive bars, not its tourist attractions. Right? Yeah. Um, and then when I'm home, it's like the complete opposite. I've got two dogs and an amazing partner that I love to spend as much time as possible. I love home cooked meals and family walks through the neighborhood. And it's like, I'm, yeah, it's like I'm 20 when I'm in the market and then I'm 80 when I'm home. <laughs> yeah. You turn to June Cleaver people. a little bit, uh, in, in, at home and, uh, you know, you get your uh, legally blonde going on when you're out just kind of just doing your thing. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. No, that's awesome. I, uh, I wish I got to go out more often. Uh, but you know, with the kid and, and family, you just, you, you take what you got. Um, and we, we took a walk with our dog last night and we got maybe a hundred yards. And my son was like, yeah, I want to go play on the swing set over there in someone else's backyard. So we knocked on their door <laughs> and we went and played on the swing set after they said yes. So it, it, it's those interruptions that are nice though, right? Like when you, when you're out and you're doing things, it's, it's finding the, the purposeful interruptions to make it have fun and make it have meaning. Yeah. So we, we've covered, uh, a lot of ground here, um, but we're going to keep covering more ground because you have, I don't know, you have a a worldview, right? You've done a lot of things for people who, who may not follow you on social media, which is, it's a, it's a great thing just to get like, what's, what's Sam up to? One of the things you did uh, last year is you had, you rocked a mullet. You've done different things with your hair, different colors You got eccentric outfits. Like what brings, you know, that style, that brand to you? Is it just because, you know, you like to have fun or just always trying to, to see what, what's next for your lifestyle and how you want to be portrayed out in, in the, in the world? Yeah, I gotta say, um, (laughs) it's, it's, it's a fun question to answer because it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of different angles to it. I've definitely been, people have commented on exactly that. Like you have outrageous hairdos and outfits at things. And, you know, I, I think as a millennial and as a young woman, trying to, you know, better my career and move up. Like one thing I'm, I'm really scared of is kind of losing myself Mm. while pursuing my goals. And so sometimes I'm a little bit louder than is maybe necessary. And, and some of it is intentional, right? Because I don't want people to forget that at the end of the day, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do, what makes me happy, Mm -hmm. you know, within, within reason. So, you know, the bourbon industry is, 
is competitive and, and it's certainly not the only industry that's competitive. And I feel like people are constantly trying to be what they're expected to be instead of just being who they are and trusting that the right thing will be attractive to them because of what they're putting out. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's not this and it's because my personality or my image doesn't line up to expectations, then this probably isn't the thing that's going to be, make me happy the rest of my life because I don't like to be stifled, right? Like I don't want to be muted or tamed or given, you know, you can only be so much yourself and then, you know, you can be that after work. Like, no, if I'm going to work as much as I do, and that's the other thing is like, if it was a nine to five where I had to wear a, you know, a, a polo with a logo on it, like, sure, I can do that. Cause I can have a life outside and, and be myself, but I do have very gray area between what is my social life and what is my work life. So I need to be enjoying it thoroughly or I'm kind of missing out on life. And I love fashion. I love big, bold statements. I like being ahead of trends. I like wearing things most people wouldn't wear because I thoroughly enjoy my quality of life when I'm in those outfits (laughs) a little bit more, you know, I I can't explain it. Um, It's just something that really gives me energy, life and, uh, you know, something something to look forward to mm. a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I can't say that I am the most eccentric person when it comes to clothes. Guys are, are, are a little less eccentric, but you know, I love the fact that you have the ability and, and a lot of women, um, in the industry and at Bardstown in particular, like have the ability to go a little bit bolder, to be themselves. And, you know, I saw Mark Irwin wear a Paisley, um, like embroidered jacket to the Bardstown bourbon, uh, world top whiskey tasters finalist, right? Like uh, even your CEO has got a little style going on with them. So like, I know that that's, that's there and, uh, it's cool that there's some empowerment, but that you get to be yourself, right? At the end of the day, if, if Sam can't be Sam, then you can't be the national brand ambassador for Bardstown. Cause you're not going to be your best self out in the marketplace. Right. Absolutely. And I'm very, I'm very happy and I've definitely, you know, noticed that, you know, maybe people around here don't like it, but nobody's tried to tell me that I can, yeah. you know, because it's just, you know, she's, she's good at what she does. So let her be herself, you know, and that's, it's great to be able to have that in a work environment for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, thinking about like being at, um, in an in a industry that tends to be male dominant, but females have made a huge stride in in bourbon and whiskey and spirits in general, especially over the last five years, I would say there's been a huge movement of just recognition for the work that's always been done uh, and what perceived from the outside may be a man's world. And it's really, truly not once you get inside of it. But, you know, for you and making that statement uh, of being a woman that is, you know, helping define a brand and, and continue to gain market share and grow, like, how does that empower you or what do you find it difficult even in those circumstances in that perceived men's environment to go and rep a brand and and help it become all it can become? You know, I think, um, I think it certainly presents its obstacles, Mm. right? Because, because the bourbon audience is so, is so male dominated, right? That sometimes if, I walk into a room and I can kind of size up these men as golfers and cigar smokers and, and, you know, they like cars. I, I assume that like, I, I don't have anything I can really talk to them about. You know what I mean, like I don't golf, I don't know cars. I, you know, and that's, that's obviously, you know, not what you should do when you walk into a room, but it can be when you're a bit nervous and you're professionally walking in like, Oh, I need to, you know, sell this brand and, and network with these people and really, you know, get them to be a a fan of the brand via me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I find that like, if, if the people, people generally surprise you, like they might, you know, be very interested in what you have to say, even if you have your only common interest is bourbon. Right. Um, so I, I feel like I'm kind of butchering this question because it's, um, you know, it, it is difficult. I think at the end of the day, whenever you're in that situation, no matter what your disadvantages or, or, 
or you're, you know, you're the black sheep for whatever reason, like just go in confident and bright in yourself. And, and people are there to, to try your bourbon. They're going to, they're going to listen to you. And if they're not, then there's a thousand other people that will like that one, that one just sour apple just, just will not matter. You, you don't need to spend your time on them or lose any sleep at night thinking like, what could I have done to want, win them over? Like if it's not you yourself being honest and a professional, yep. then it's not going to be anything, you mm-hmm. know? So you kind of just have to take it with a grain of salt. And I think everybody deals with that in some capacity or another, either you're the youngest person in the office or you're the oldest person in the office, or, you know, there's always something that gets in people's heads that says, I'm at a disadvantage here. And yeah. I think you just got to ab- abandon that and just go in strong and confident. Yeah. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think the, the last stats I saw was like, uh, let's just call it 80, 20, right. Male to female in the bourbon, you know, scene in the whiskey scene, but the, a lot, it's so funny, like talking to brands, like there's more and more women distillers. There's more and more women blenders. There's more and more women that are creating the, experience that you have, like, you know, the cocktail creations that you all bring to to life. Like you have a big hand in all of those things. Like people don't realize how much women make the bourbon industry and the whiskey industry go round and round. And I think that's, I think that's, what's really cool is that once you get in there, you actually get to see the appreciation that the people in the industry have for, for women and people like yourself. Yeah. I think the biggest, I think the biggest disconnect is between the consumer and the female professionals and not so much like the industry being like, you know, no one's like out there going like, Oh, we're only going to hire men. Like, <laughs> like women, like, like, you know, under our, our house, our, our brand house, you know, like we're very female, you know, females are everywhere. There are warehouse manager, there are, uh, you know, beverage director, there the brand ambassador, they're, they're everywhere. There our CFO is a, is a female. So it's, it's really just kind of, I, I think celebrating them more and recognizing them is, is moving the needle for the consumers that yeah. assume I, women don't drink bourbon and therefore don't work in bourbon. I, I don't know, but I, I do see it making like huge strides just in the five years that I've been with the brand, just yeah. a little bit more part of the conversation naturally instead of like, Oh, wow. Mm. You know, it's just like, it's just, it's just organic. It's just like, of course. Awesome. That's great. You know? Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you one thing that's like really close to, to home with you. I think, uh, before we get into our last question is, uh, you, you came from bartending and one of the things you like to do is, is craft cocktails, um, and, yeah. and your creation. So as we head into this next season, where like almost summer's coming to a close, pools will close in Labor Day here in a few weeks and falls right around the corner. What's the, what's the cocktail creation that we should be thinking about to get ready for our, our fall Saturdays and Sundays watching a football game maybe, or, you know, going out to a pumpkin patch? What's the fall cof- cocktail creation that we should be looking forward to? I honestly, I think one of my favorite things about when the weather gets cold is packing up a hot toddy in my thermos for all of those things for football games, for pumpkin patches, for haunted mazes, like whatever you're doing outside. Um, you know, even just sitting around the fire, I think there's so many, so many people sleep on a hot toddy and it's a, it's a totally like build your own thing. Right. Yeah. Like I think, I think hot toddies are less successful in bars and restaurants and more successful for the at home bartender because you can hodgepodge whatever you want to throw into a hot drink. Like I like, um, I like cayenne and honey in mine. Yeah. Um, cause like that, that sweet heat is just delicious. And then it literally just keeps you warm on top of like the temperature, just the spice in your body, just keeping your, your body temperature up is so great. Um, and then my other like favorite fireside cocktail is probably a Manhattan, which is pretty typical, right? Yeah. But something about like just the aromatics of the vermouth, just kind of just just ring, sing fall and winter to me. And um, it's strong, which is what you kind of want in the <laughs> wintertime. You need a good strong drink. So yeah. those are my two go-tos going into the colder months. 
Hot toddy, that, that's an underrated drink. I had one at a bar not too long ago in Napa and uh, really enjoyed that. Actually, shoot, it's already been in January since I was in Napa, but had a had a hot toddy that was served there and honey and lemon just go really well together. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and maybe and maybe it's not honey and lemon, you know, like maybe it's, um, you know, Javi made this cocktail once. It was more of like a, a hot buttered rum Mm. than anything but still kind of under that hot toddy umbrella right like a hot drink with bourbon yeah and instead of butter he made like a sweet potato butter so it had like like reduced sweet potato and cream and it was freaking delicious um i'm just i'm telling you there's a there's a lot you can do to a hot toddy and and then you can throw it in your thermos or your yeti and tell people it's coffee and no one knows any better as long as you're responsible. <laughs> you're ready. You're ready to face the day at that, that point, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't go to work like that. You know what I mean? But if yeah. you want to go to your nephew's football game, I say go for it. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? but, yeah, especially when you have to go to your nephew's football game and it's raining. Uh, and that's just miserable. Yeah. Yeah, that's 100%, the, that's yeah. when you definitely need the hot toddy. So um, yeah. uh, that's great. I think everyone should be uh, Googling their favorite hot toddy recipe um, or, you know, what's your favorite Manhattan? I, nah, I just can't do Manhattans. I wish I could. I just, me and Vermouth don't get along. We like, we punch each other. Um, Vermouth like punches me in the mouth and I just yell about it um, verbally back. Um, just never, never done it. Chow. Challenge accepted, Jake. I will right. make I will make you a Manhattan that you like. I promise. Okay, I, I'm down. Uh, I actually am coming to the distillery September second, which is in two Fridays. Oh man, I got another really good friend from Pensacola uh, coming up that day too. She's the owner of Old Hickory Whiskey Bar. Oh sweet! I got to introduce you. Yeah, she's a badass. Oh, I think I met her at uh, Whiskey Live. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That See, was her. Yeah, so, you guys were both there. What a coincidence. So small cool. small world. Yeah. Uh Danny Boy's gonna walk us through some cool stuff. Um on uh we're featuring Bardstown Bourbon Company for uh Bourbon Heritage Month in September. So Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like a great time. Nothing like making a little work fun here on the podcast, is what I like to say. Um Yeah. <laughs> so look forward to seeing you uh here in a, in a few weeks. Uh but lastly, this is I prepped you in Tennessee. Three weeks ago, uh, you admitted to me before the podcast that you had not thought about the question. Um, and I asked this for, of all the guests at the very end, what's your one piece of advice to kind of enjoy those moments in between or, or get away from uh, the work life or the stresses of life? You know, the moments in between is, is hard. You got to, sometimes you got to convince yourself to get up and sometimes you got to convince yourself to sit down and take a break. But what I will say, just to kind of divert a little bit, but still, I think, answer your question, is that um, I think everybody at one time in their life should really go see some stand-up comedy, especially if you have some comedy clubs local to you. Like, we've got a couple in Louisville, and one almost went under because of the pandemic. And, and I find that kind of sad because during the pandemic and during quarantine, everybody was watching these Netflix stand-up comedy specials to keep their sanity and to keep some levity in their day-to-day -day life. And none of those comedians would be on Netflix had they not done years of gigs in comedy clubs. And a lot of the comedy clubs closed during the pandemic, never opened again. And a lot of them that are open are still really struggling. So the next time you're like, Either you got one at home or you're on vacation and it's not typically on your list, go to a comedy club because it really does kind of pull you out of your element. Like you're you're thoroughly engaged and you're experiencing it with a hundred different strangers, which is kind of a different sort of experience I don't think you can get anywhere else. So kind of cheating on the question, but it kind of came up organically through our discussion. I think if I had one piece of advice, it would be go see a comedy show. If it's terrible you're going to enjoy it. You're going to remember it the rest of your life because it was so terrible and cringy and awkward. And if it's great, you're going to have a great time. <laughs> and if it's anywhere in between, you can at least check it off your list, but it's, it's an experience I encourage everyone to do. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, like laughter's laughter's health, 
um, when you smile, when you laugh, you're genuinely, um, a healthier individual. Like there's science behind that, which is kind of crazy. So I think that's great. Um, I haven't been to a comedy club in like 10 years, so I should probably revisit one. I know there's a brand new one where in Parazelli's used to be on main street. So maybe you have to go check that out or comedy caravan, uh, over in the Highlands is another good one. If that's still there. I don't know. That's- yeah, it is still there. It's a common date night for me and Javi is to go there on Wednesday nights for open mic night. Nice. So if you ever want to go, if you if you and your wife can ever get a babysitter, uh, let me know and we can we can make it uh, a double date or something. There we go. I like it. Um, and that's that's good. I'm glad it's not a it's not about the cell phone this time here on on off hours with Bourbon Lens. Uh, so really really pumped about that. Um, Sam, if people want to learn more about like what you're doing and what Bardstown Bourbon Company is doing, I got to give you a, you know 30 seconds to shine. So where can people find out more about Sam and and the brand? Yeah. So about me, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, it's a uh, at there for you in spirits, all one word. Um, it is mostly like kind of where I'm traveling and what kind of trouble I'm getting into. I would say, um, maybe a little bit more than brand focused, um, (laughs) but (laughs) all good stuff. And then if you want to know what the brand is doing, I'm certainly posting updates on, on that Instagram, but, uh, your best source will be the Bardstown bourbon co handle. So at Bardstown bourbon co, uh, for, you know, we'll tell you everything when we've got new products getting launched, new products in the gift shop, um, you know, ex- tours, experiences at the distillery. You can all go through our, our link in our bio to, to sign up for those things, see what's available. So just stay connected with us. And, and hopefully we, we see a lot of you out here at the distillery. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you joining me today, uh, to, to talk about just what's, what's up with Sam Montgomery. Like it's just it's fun. I, I'm honored that you had me, yeah. honestly. It well, was fun. We really appreciate it. Uh, we want to say thank you to our sponsor, Off Hours, for sponsoring this episode. If you want to learn more about Off Hours Bourbon, go over to Drink Off Hours on Instagram. If you want to find out more about Bourbon Lens, go over to Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. Pretty simple. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.